This is the X Sports Network. Back nine here from Mahali Sports, a brand new golf show that we are debuting here today on the X Sports Network. I'm AJ Good. I'm joined alongside Jason Vaughn, Daniel Creel, and the best NAI men's basketball manager in the world, Hayden Burks, on the other side here. And uh, guys, brand new show we got going on. We're doing it here from Mahali Sports. You guys are the golf pros here. But the first things first, not many people know who you are back in Lawrenceburg. Once you guys introduce yourselves, Jason, we'll start off with you. Yes, sir, AJ. Um, Jason Vaughn, um, PGA member. Um, been teaching for probably about 20 years. Grew up um, in Florence. Uh, some, uh, I guess grew up in Decatur. Came to play golf at UNA. Ended up um, getting into the golf business. I've uh, been teaching for about 20 years and um, just love what I do. So. Yes, sir. Yeah. Daniel? Yeah. Uh, so, like Jason, I'm a member of the PGA. I'm fresh. He's been, how long have you been in the PGA? 22 years. 22 years. Uh, I've been teaching just kind of away from the PGA, kind of do my own thing. Been around golf my entire life. Uh, played at a high level in high school. Uh, individual champion in high school. Led the team to a state championship in high school. Right out of high school, signed with Alabama. Played there for two and a half years. Got injured. Didn't know if I was really going to play again. The coach at UNA recruited me pretty heavy and I uh, got a medical red shirt. So got me in there and uh, ended up playing a semester in, or a year and a half there. Um, played really good there. And like Jason, we're all Americans in college. So we're both all Americans, uh, all conference. Uh, I know I won an individual title in the conference and uh, we went to the national yep. championship every year. You guys kind of, he's a little older than me, <laughs> but he started paving the way for us, man. Definitely. I mean, the teams at UNA were just so strong. So I was happy to move back home and uh, play for a good school. Uh, been teaching for off and on, not full time. I've always, I, I guess I got in the golf business, what, no, nine worked for you. I, that's correct. And uh, we were at Robert Trent Jones of the we Shoals were. and uh, I decided I like playing golf more than I like working behind a counter <laughs> so I did that for a little bit and got into some sales but I always stayed teaching and it just drew me back in in the last two years I've been teaching basically full-time me and Jason partnered up and uh, luckily Wahali was 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 nice enough to help us out and give us a place to teach and we've we've built a pretty cool facility uh, along with Wahali so what got you guys into golf what started your love for golf and then turned it into a profession in and it's probably the same way with Daniel. You know, my dad played, um, my brother played, my grandfather played, and so it was kind of a family thing. And so ended up starting when I was two or three years old, um, just like I've started my kids at, at that same age and given them uh, the interest. If the interest is there, then they can go and do it. The same thing was given to me is the just kind of put me out on the golf course, took me to play, and then they would drop me off there, you know, every day during the summer. And that's what we did is we played golf. And getting into the PGA, um, right when I came out of school, I played professionally for about six months. And um, it's really hard to make any money playing professionally. I'm sure Daniel played more professional than I did, um, but I struggled to make any money, so my wife was like, go get a real job. And so do something in golf. It's funny and, people don't think this is a real job yeah. either. I know. They're like, man, you do. That's the greatest job ever. And it, it is a real job, but it's it, and it's also a real love for teaching right. and seeing people improve and seeing golfers get better and seeing them grow up, uh, come up in the game. And so, and that's one thing, the main reason that we get in the PGA is we love to love to instruct, love to be around golf. Yeah. David? Same thing. I mean, just echo what he said. Uh, my family, we did it after school. We would go out there and we would walk our course, which is a local course in town, and it was laid out where three holes kind of circle around, and that was good for a three-year-old and my brother, which was eight at the time, and then I had another brother. We're five years apart, and I guess that puts him at 13, 14. Um, 
I would just ride on my mom's pool. I just remember her putting me on a pool cart. We didn't have enough money to get golf carts. And uh, I would just hop on her pool cart and just go to those three holes and hit. And I uh, started at age two, started playing competitively at three. It was unbelievable. Wow. You know, I don't remember those days, but supposedly I was decent then. I don't know. Uh, it worked out well for you. It, it did. So uh, the thing, what he said that really, you know, hits me, and I think that we're trying to address now is people play golf because their mom, dad, or granddad play. It's somebody in the family that gets a golfer out there. Yeah. It's not because, hey, we have this in PE, or we, you, nobody just wakes up and is like, I'm going out for the golf team. Very few. I mean, golf teams are struggling to even get five players, and you need five, and you get four scores. I don't, that's how it was when I was growing up. So we're doing, and, and Jason's part of this along with me, we're in an effort to introduce, we're putting in programs into every school in our county, and we're actually gonna be focusing in Tennessee later so that kids can be introduced to golf outside of having a family member. So pretty cool. And for you guys, this building here and everything you got going on in Wahali, just uh, to tell everyone how important it is and what you guys do here on a, on a day in, day out basis. I think that this driving range has made a huge difference in the golfing community. Number one, um, we've always needed, we've had driving ranges in the area that have been lit. And now this one honestly is, um, fully integrated technology and it's been really good to the community i think we can see that through um through our people that we teach and just through what we hear uh, i think it is um going to help continue to grow golf you know down the road yeah yeah, yeah the facility is uh, is awesome I, I mean hopefully one day we'll get keith in here which is the owner of the facility and we'll talk a little bit more about his vision and what he has going on but the key thing is we're mixing and top golf kind of paved the way the first of its kind to mix technology and entertainment yeah. with the boring sport of golf which i don't think it's boring no, I mean, gosh, it's, it's a boring. constant grind but yeah. again the, the thing is is there's it's an individual sport so you don't really bounce ideas or teams you, you rely on yourself and it, it can be tough um so mixing the entertainment with the golf now we've grown the game of golf and i was talking to keith the other day talking about the local school here, which is Rogers yeah. saying that they couldn't even fill a golf team a year ago, barely. And now they're having multiple days of trials because there's so many kids wanting to play golf. And yeah. there's only one thing that's changed and that's what Holly golf has been in the facility or in the area. And I think other schools are feeling the same positive effects for it. Yeah, that's the goal of this, you know, mm -hmm. to grow the game. And uh, like that's, you guys said, it. it's a, you're Definitely. already starting to see the fruits of your labor out here. Definitely. Yes. It's a, sport you can play your entire life so that's one thing and, it, and again it's um it's fun uh, there, there's no reason that golf shouldn't be in every family or every household yeah hey yeah guys i was going to ask um when it comes like we were talking about top golf and all that stuff i know top golf is more of like an entertainment type of thing like you know you go there hang out and like eat and all that stuff i know y'all have that you have axe throwing but like what's the difference like when it comes to it seems like y'all are more into the teaching side of it and making sure golfers grow like you've been saying yes yeah, so Top golf really, I mean, I'm telling you, really opened up the doors and an idea and paved the way of, hey, inter golf is kind of like bowling. You can go and not really know what you're doing. Do you I mean, do you care about bowling? Do you uh, play competitive? I don't play, no, not bowling. I try to play golf, but I'm close to that triple digits. Well, I'm talking about bowling. I'm just yeah. saying, like, but you go to yeah. the bowling alley oh, yeah. and just try exactly. and have fun yeah. and pass the time because mm -hmm. it's entertaining. Yeah. Well, that's what Top Golf really did is you add some technology. It, it There's games out there that anybody can play and score. Mm -hmm and uh but yet you're learning golf and that's kind of I, I relate it to bowling because again it's just entertainment we don't want to be a professional bowler right there's some of us that might do and again what well, what keith did is top golf is a little different it's a smaller piece of property and the golf balls are not real golf balls they're they're a little bit lighter they have a microchip in them and they they're limited flight things that they don't go very far um well this you're able to use real golf balls and hit you got a bigger piece of property and you get real ball data where at top golf you're just hitting into a shape or a circle and trying to get points here you're actually getting carry distances total distances you're playing golf courses so for people that do want to improve their golf game this is a great place to train but for the people that just want to come for entertainment you can do that too just like at a top golf gotcha and most people don't realize but top tracer is what is used here mm -hmm is owned by Top Golf, yeah. which is ultimately owned by Callaway. Yeah. Uh, I actually used that 
that Trace app. It's very handy. Mm-hmm. It comes in very handy ways. Yeah. Jason? I just want to echo what Daniel said. I think the, the big thing is the data that you gather here is correct by, you know, flight, carry. Um, and so the, the, ha- the goal was to, to have real golf balls. You know, we've always had it, some of the driving ranges in the area We've had limited flight golf balls because of the distance or you didn't have enough um, distance at the back of the driving range. This one has 340, 350 yards and having real golf balls, I think is important. Like Daniel said, for practice, you have to be able to know exactly what your carry is or you're gonna hit a bad shot when you go to play. So that's one thing that that we have the capability to do here. What's cool about it is it goes to your phone. So if you really do wanna hone in your game and zero in, you tell the system, hey, I'm hitting a nine iron, and every nine iron logs into your phone so you know exactly your tendencies and your strengths and weaknesses. Mm-hmm. You can go to driver and do the same. So you might go home and just review your data afterwards, and that's when you're starting to process all the information where a lot of people just come and hit balls just yeah. for fun, and you just don't do that. You're just like, man, it was fun, whatever, but they don't really know all the what data. What they actually so this, did. Yeah. So this, again, is tailored for both entertainment and for player improvement is awesome awesome yeah. awesome and what i've learned from the top tracer app is that i hit the ball to the right a lot <laughs> like a it'll lot. tell you it, that yeah it, yeah it tells me it, yeah. it, it's probably people in a pop give me a notification should probably quit this game at some point <laughs> in your life but, uh, we don't want to do that no no not not yet not yet well coming up next the guys and i are going to discuss what's going on in the world of golf we got the Ryder cup plus a local kid just down the road in Athens, won a PGA Tour event that's coming up next on Back Nine. If you could live anywhere, where would it be? And what would it be like? With today's home values, this is the perfect time to sell and make those dreams real. When you work with a world-class agent at Coldwell Banker, you benefit from trusted guidance in our revolutionary seller's assurance program to make your home sale more rewarding than ever. So it really is true. Your dreams don't have to be just dreams. Southern Tennessee Orthopedics welcomes orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Paul Thomas. Count on Dr. Paul Thomas, podiatrist, Dr. James Barksdale, and nurse practitioner, Doug Eid at Southern Tennessee Orthopedics to keep your life in motion. Injuries and foot pain can rob you of the activities you enjoy most. So our team is here, close to home, to address the pain and to get you moving again. Southern Tennessee Orthopedics, from the routine to the unforeseen, you can count on us. To learn more, visit southerntennesseemedicalgroup.com or to schedule an appointment, call 931-762-4400. If you're stuck, then you're in luck. Call Tower McDowell with in-service towing, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for quick, reliable service. When you find yourself in a bind, in-service offers full service towing and recovery services as well as vehicle lockouts, jump starts, and emergency roadside assistance. Family owned, family operated. When you need a hand, call in-service towing or ask for them by name. Serving Southern Tennessee and North Alabama. Phone number 931-843-9098 or visit inservicespecialties.com. Story and Lee, the Tennessee Valley's most dynamic furniture store, featuring our Made in America galleries with solid wood dining and bedrooms, leather furniture, mattresses, and so much more. You want it? We've got it. With our three acres of showroom and our huge warehouse, we're sure to have exactly what you want. And it's all ready to be delivered to your home absolutely free. Just try that anywhere else. We are Story and Lee. This is is the Exports Network. Welcome back to Back Nine here at Wahali Sports here, joined by Jason Vaughn, Daniel Creel, and Hayden Burks. And guys, talk about things going down in the world of golf. Obviously, coming up very soon, we have the Ryder Cup. Heading over to Rome, Italy. Long way to go for uh, some of our Americans. And uh, 
it's a bit that's you know kind of controversial because you have who's going to be on the European side who's going to be the, on the American side obviously it's like picking two all-star teams uh, coming up here but it's an important event and there's a lot of pride on the line for both sides and the, and there is and I love watching the Ryder Cup I actually uh, to me I love match play events I love mm -hmm. events like this you've got alternate shot you've got you know you're playing your own ball then you've got singles coming down on Sunday and so and you know there's been a lot of controversy starting out you know over a year ago two years ago after the end of the Ryder Cup and the start of this the live golf tour and I know um, some of that has changed here recently but you know there was some big big controversy going on with are these guys going to get to play um, on the European side, on the PGA Tour side, we lost a, a captain. You know, Andre Stinson went to the Live Golf, and then he ended up not being able to um, to coach the team. And so, I just I think it's going to be very interesting with who they um, get to pick and who is on the team. Yeah, a lot of controversy out there, especially before the big announcement with sure. Jay Monahan and the PGA deciding to sit, maybe try to work something out. Which I mean, there's a lot of legal stuff going on, a lot of upset players and, sure um, and, you know i think it's a good thing for golf i think it was inevitable i kind of predicted it i didn't think it would happen this soon that the two tours would merge um but there's still a lot of bad blood out there yeah. and you know as we know the Ryder cup is a team event which is yeah. you know you don't it's an individual sport i mean notoriously i mean unless you're playing in high school and college yeah. and still even then it has that individual feel uh, like you said match play is fun I love it. You can make a triple bogey and you only lose one hole. You're only one down. Yeah. Somebody can make birdie. Yeah. It's a four-stroke swing, but you're only one down. You can, if you, if you keep it right between the ears, you can stay in the match. Yeah. Um, because you you can't throw it away in just one hole. Um, so I love that about it. And then the sh the individuals, a team a, a team can move a lot, gain a lot of ground in yeah. the individuals. And there's just so many good players in both both sides, uh, the European and the Americans. Uh, I think that they're saying that the Americans look stronger, but I just, I don't know. On, on paper, they both look pretty solid. Yeah, and, and it, the Europeans always take this more seriously than the Americans do. I mean, that's kind of been the, throughout the history, you know, you seem a little bit more of team camaraderie out of the Europeans than the Americans. Why, why is it that, the, and the, how many comebacks have the Europeans made on the final day? You know, that's happened a lot. Why, why is it the perception that the Europeans take more seriously than the Americans do? I think it's the pride of country. I mean, honestly, I think that they love to win. They love to beat the Americans. Um, you know, as Americans, um, we seem to, I guess, kind of be blessed with everything or, or we have the ability to do do different things. And so as Europeans, they want to, you know, kind of take us over. And so, and that's what they want to do when they play in the, in the Ryder Cup is they, they seem to to put their all into every shot, and then especially being in Italy and being over on the European side, they're actually um, it's going to be the crowd. You know, the crowd just seems to always get into it for the Europeans as well. And so um, you'll see flags, and you'll see guys dressed up in you know the colors of the country. And so it's just, it's an amazing venue. Uh, I would probably be really nervous to play in that venue. I would. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people and uh, more are probably rooting against you if you're an American. Sure. But I, I feel like, you know, it's basically the Americans, the North Americans against the rest of the world, right? Yeah. And they yeah. come from, there's so many small countries, and we're used to the U.S. I mean, it's yeah. just so it's big, right? Yeah. We're, yeah. And uh, I think they're perceived as the underdogs. And, again, everybody likes to root for the underdogs, so I think it makes for good storylines. Um, I think even the Americans can kind of root for them here and there. It's yeah. just a fun event. And, again, um, I, I think that's part of it is just them being feeling the underdog. They want to get the U.S. players um, and just wear them out. I mean, and I really do think it's not only the, the players, but it's the fans. They get into sure. it so much more. 100%. Than, 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 than the U.S. side yeah. tends to. But, again, it's it's fun. Every, every couple of years we get to watch it, and I think we can we can enjoy it. And, and obviously picking the teams or they haven't completed who's playing yet so that's but there's certain guys out there who are on the bubble but they're struggling and uh, especially on the american side i, I think uh, whoever the captain is is having some trouble right now picking like all right you know I, obviously i want to pick the hot hand but i also want to take 
the best I can find in my country overseas with me. Definitely. And, you know, so in, on the American team, it's six golfers that make it, and then there's six picks that they get. And so we've still got tournaments going on right now. We've got the Wyndham this week. Um, and so there's a chance to get points. It goes all the way into the playoffs. And then, um, you know, they'll have those six automatic qualifiers, and then they'll have six people that they'll have to pick. So um, he does have a tough job. Zach has a tough job, Zach Johnson. And then, but he's got also some good uh, vice captains, one of them being Stuart Sink, who's from this area. Yeah. That, and those guys are going to help him a lot to be able – to pick the six guys that should go along with the six qualifiers. So we'll see who's an automatic qualifier, and then they'll be able to pick the other players. So, um, and there's some good names out there. Um, one of them being Brooks Kepka, who is on the live and thought that he wasn't even gonna have a chance to even play. Yeah. So it's uh, that's gonna be a neat story to see how all of it unfolds. Yeah, it, you know, I don't envy Zach on this at all. Um, I mean, everybody's kind of looking at Zach on this. Yeah. Um, it can be somewhat a little bit political, like anything in any kind of organized sports. But also, you got to look at other dynamics. Who plays well on teams? You know, who who hangs in there? Who's going to fight and not just give up? So it, they're going to look at not only how well they've been doing on the tour in the recent days, but the guys that are the go-tos that seem to just play well in these team events. So it's tough decisions. So, you, I mean, we can say a notable name. I mean, Justin Thomas is always a hot, you know, commodity for this, and they they love watching him, and usually he does pretty good. But he's been struggling, so that's a tough decision. I mean, he's not performing right now. Um, but again, in history, uh, I don't have it in front of me, but I think he's historically played pretty well in the Ryder Cup, and yeah. and people want to be on his team. So there's tough decisions going ahead, and it's on both sides. Yeah. Uh, they, they have picks to do, but, again, they're surrounded by co-captains and, and things like that that help make those decisions. And we've still got two months of golf left. Yeah. You know, I don't know yeah. when the – when do the picks have to be in? I'm not even sure. Um, it, it can I be think all the way down to the wire, maybe. It definitely can all the way at the end of the playoffs. Mm -hmm. So it's... you could get a player that wins two times in the next – you never know. Somebody that's yeah. on a hot streak, and they might have a chance. Um, there's a few that – we're playing good late last year that might have been like, hey, these are for sure ends, and now they're just not performing. So uh, some pressure on some of these guys coming down the stretch. Yeah. Hey. yeah, when it comes to the – with the Ryder Cup, you know, the excitement around it with the Europeans and the Americans and the fans and all that stuff, what, can you explain, like, the significance of what this means for the sport of golf right now? Yeah, I mean, again, it's – in golf, you usually – you have your favorite players, and there's only one winner. There's one guy that's going to win each week. And what's great about golf is everybody kind of gra gravitates towards that player or that storyline for that week, right? And they, they, they typically like that player for the week. Yeah. I mean, you might be the biggest Tiger fan out there, but if uh, another player comes up, let's say Scotty Scheffler, hey, I like him too, and I'm rooting him on. So you're rooting on both. But in football, you're rooting against one team, and you're rooting for one team. And that's what we get in this dynamic. We have the Americans, and we have the rest of the world, and it's which, what country, where, where are you from, and who are you with? And that makes it fun to root for a team for once. Mm -hmm. So that, that's why I enjoy the Ryder Cup. It's a team effort. It, Anything can happen over multiple days. It's not just an hour sport like some of these, you know, the one hour, two hours, and you get closure at the end of the day. I mean, this thing takes several days. Yeah, several days. That's mm -hmm. the excitement of golf. That's what I like about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I'm, I echo what he says. And I think as an amateur golfer, you play some events that are match play or that are team things when you're playing in high school and playing in college. And as you become a professional golfer, it really is a lot of individualized and you're making a living. Well, at this, it is, it's team, like Daniel says, it's team against team. And, you know, one guy may play bad, but his teammate may pick him up. And so and that's what I think makes it so interesting is, um, you know, it, it, match play is just something that you don't see a lot with professional golfers. And I think this is yep. a big, a big event in, I guess, in the, in the world of it's golf. It's easy to follow. Yeah. It's not, it may, you know, you don't have to really understand. It's easy and say one up, two up. Everybody's wearing the same uniforms. Absolutely. It's easy yeah. to s distinguish who's yeah. for who. Yeah. So it's more like your traditional sports where people can turn it on and just watch it. You don't have to be a golfer absolutely. to get excited about mm -hmm. it. And that is awesome, right? That's yeah, what we absolutely. Need more yeah, exactly. Because like people don't realize like golf is major around the world. Like mm -hmm. everybody thinks like you know football, basketball, baseball. I mean, overseas golf is one of the top sports mm -hmm. there is over there. 
at the time. So that's why I love about golf because, I mean, it's just a world sport that everybody can enjoy and right. find excitement about. Definitely. Yeah. Now moving to the PGA Tour, I had a local kid this past week, Lee Hodges, down the road in Athens, won the 3M Open, won it pretty dominant fashion, seven-stroke win there, and uh, big win for the kid. And uh, Not many people knew, knew who he was going into it, but now after winning, what, million and a half dollars uh, i think a lot of people know who this guy is now definitely and you know he's he's from ardmore plays out at Cambridge. um you know that's his home course uh super nice kid super good you know good golfer um played at alabama and you know i think that he's got a bright future ahead of him and so uh it just it was awesome to see him go from wire to wire i got to watch the last round and he's probably hitting the ball as good as i've seen him hit it and also putting the ball as good as i've seen him putt and um you know he he actually has played out at blackberry here in town and so it's really really awesome to see him go out on the pga tour and win not that many people could say well we've got a guy that's you know an hour down the road that won a pga tour event so yeah it's awesome he's uh again a big name around here uh, i've been following him and just he's been on tour what three years maybe? three years and uh i think i read that he's had 65 starts he's only had two top five finishes one of those includes a win but the thing is, is what people don't give guys like him credit for is he's been on tour for three years and he's maintained his card. I mean, you're playing darn good golf to play with the best golfers around the world. Yeah. I mean, it's a tough go to, to keep that, that job. Yeah. Um, and again, he's done well. He's, he's, he's raking in the money and uh, maybe this will give him the confidence to, to go out there and perform a little bit better. He's, I like seeing a guy like him win. Um, He's not super long. He does hit it straight. He's a pretty boring golfer. If you played golf with him, I've just heard <laughs> stories. He just hits it, and everybody's like, well, he gets it in the hole, but he didn't really do anything super impressive. Yeah, he didn't do anything that correct. Like, I don't understand. Yeah. He just shot five under, but I, it didn't seem I – didn't, yeah. I didn't – most people think that those guys just hit it right at the hole every time, and they just don't. They just make very few mistakes, and the mistakes right. they do make are minor. And, again, this last week he, he, he played his butt off to win in – but that kind of margin against the best players in the world is unheard of. Um, so that's the confidence he needs going forward. And with the Ryder Cup coming up, you never know. He's not in the talks yet, but maybe yeah. he will be if he yeah. continues to play. Yeah. You, uh, you guys were talking about uh, his coach at Bama. I actually went up there and watched him play, and he started a UAB and found his way back to Bama. So that's a pretty neat story. It is, yeah. So I played at Alabama. J.C. Wool was the coach there. J.C. Wool was the coach that actually got to coach – um, Lee Hodges and uh, they did an interview with with Jay and he, he talked about passing him up and he did yeah passed up on Lee thought there was another better player he gave people don't realize there's only four and a half scholarships right. for a D1 team right. yeah. you got to have five players to travel yeah and you only have four and a half scholarships so you, and you're trying to build a team of eight to ten guys just in case you never know what's going to happen so you, your money spread thin and um, passed on Lee Lee went to UAB and um played well and Jay made a mistake and uh, from what I could read and his, through his interview he, he got the money he needed and, and got him back home at Alabama so roll tide and uh, again he played really well I think he came runner up in the national championship in the individual uh, his senior year I mean he's so he, kids talented yeah. just great just took him a little while to win on tour yeah. what a lot what most people don't realize you win a PJ tour event you qualify for the majors now. And Definitely. now he gets that chance to go to Augusta, mm -hmm. gets to play in some of these other big events. So now, not only winning that, he gets a million and a half dollars, but he also gets a free pass to some of the biggest events in the world. And I think that his game is going to fit Augusta National and fit with the Masters because he hits the ball straight. He, he plays a nice little fade, and I, I love to see a fade. I play a fade, and I think that it, it plays really, really well. There's some of the holes at Augusta that you need to move it right to left, but to get to some of those flag sticks, the greens are firm. The greens are usually fast, and so I like the way that he, you know, the way that he hits the ball. And so I think it's great that he has the capability now to go and play in those, which he didn't before to qualify for some of these events. The majors like that, you have to win a PGA event. So now that he's done that, he gets the chance to go and play. Yeah, uh, a lot of exemptions, plus he secures his tour card for a little bit longer. Uh, different tournaments offer different things. For sure. uh, I didn't get to look at that. Um, I'm, I can't wait to see him at Augusta root for a local kid. For but sure. again, you got to learn how to work the ball. And he's notoriously a straight ball hitter. I mean, yeah, his ball does like to fall to the right. 
but um, me and Jason were talking earlier, and um, you were coached by his coach. I was. He likes a pretty straight path, like a zeroed out path. He does. Exit quick to the left, which means the ball can kind of favor both directions, which may not be the best thing. But again, if you if you want to hit straight shots and you you can do it time after time, which he's obviously capable of doing, is good. But Augusta, if, if, if you got to work the ball, it could be a little tough for him. Yep. Well, speaking of Lee Hodges and the swing, these guys here during our instruction period are going to break down the differences in it, how unorthodox it is, and why it works for Lee. That's coming up next here on the back nine. For decades, First Class Charter has provided high quality motor coach transportation services to the Tennessee Valley. With numerous safety and cleanliness accreditations, First Class Charter is ready to make your group trip a reality. Contact us today by visiting firstclasscharter.net. First Class Charter, the official motor coach company of the North Alabama Lions. Great food is just a short drive to Heine's Barbecue in Lawrenceburg. Mouthwatering is just one way to describe the amazing flavors of the best piece of Heine in town. When you dig into a plate of pulled pork, hand chopped brisket, chicken, wood fire oven pizzas, and the menu goes on. Wash it all down with a swig of Heine Shine Lemonade and then make your way over to the gift shop full of Heine sauces, snacks, and more. Heine's Barbecue, Highway 43 North in Lawrenceburg. Lawrenceburg Flooring & More is your premier source for hardwood, laminate, luxury vinyl tile, sheet vinyl, residential and commercial carpet, carpet tiles, ceramic and porcelain tile, waterproof floating floor, plus blinds and shutters. Lawrenceburg Flooring & More is also home to all name brands and can tackle projects big and small. Installation? You're covered with installers who've got years of experience and stand behind their work. Let Lawrenceburg Flooring & More make your design dreams a reality. 2760 Highway 43 North or visit lawrenceburgflooringandmore.com This is the X Sports Network. Back here at the back nine from Mahali Sports. Now time to talk instruction here with our two golf pros and Jason Vaughn and Daniel Creel. And guys, we're talking about Lee Hodges, you know, down the road here from Ardmore here in uh, Northern Alabama. An orthodox swing. Just tell everyone, describe to everyone what that means and and why it's different than everybody else. Hey, again, when you say unorthodox, it's not super unorthodox. Yeah. What he does is again, me when I teach, um, I like to trend towards finding somebody's stock shot. I don't like their path. Like a lot of people say, well, I want my path to be zero. That means I'm going to hit it straight. And that's not necessary. It'll help you hit it straight, but your club face has to match. And the thing is, is everybody's club face is the hardest part to control. Mm -hmm. So if the face can be a little bit closed, you're going to be hitting a pull draw. And this is assuming you have a zero club path. And then if it's a little bit open, it's going to be a little push. So it brings in, basically you're on a point and you can miss left or right. And that's kind of hard if you don't know where your tendencies are. So I like to find somebody's stock shot. And um, I like to find somebody's stock shot, and I like it to favor a very noticeable little bit of a draw or a fade. I don't want slices and hooks, but I like something to be offset of zero a little bit. So we can work from that. And you've always heard probably, and I know Jason, we talk about it quite a bit, is you, you like to take out one side of the course strategically. Uh, strategically, if you can do that and you know your tendency, say I tend to miss, if anything, a little bit right of the flag, you can actually use that strategy to play golf. So you're not gonna shoot at every flag. So let's, let's assume you, the, the pin is on the right side of the green. I have the tendency to miss right. I'm gonna aim towards the middle of that green. And if I hit it straight, I'm gonna be in the middle of the green, but I tend to push it and it's gonna be close to the hole. If the pin's left and I still have that same tendency, I can aim dead at that flag because I very rarely miss it left. So I'm playing to my odds. It's, it's almost 
it's, it's kind of like gambling a little bit, yeah. but again, it's educational. Um, yeah. And back to, to Lee is he's on zero. Um, and I, for me, that would be hard for me to control, but that's kind of what his teacher teaches, and he's controlled it really well. He comes in with a, with a bent right arm that keeps him tucked in and keeps good side bend, and, and it makes him swing left, so he actually has predictable face control. Not everybody can do that and has that good coordination. Um, what I do like about his game is he has – a little bit different of an iron swing and a driver swing and I don't know Jason I would like to hear your opinion is when you're teaching students do you teach a different iron and driver swing when they say hey I'm struggling with my driver I usually look at their irons first and say hey I just want you to swing kind of the same we're just going to maybe move weight around but we're not really changing the swing very much I don't teach two different swings mm -hmm. or do my best to not teach two different swings mm -hmm. to me it's two different setups and you have your weight distribution a little bit different but it's mm -hmm. really two very similar golf swings. So moving the ball position creates the impact area to be a little bit different, which the swing changes where it is just right. off weight and ball position, right? And that's kind of how I do. Definitely. It simplifies a lot. But when I got to looking at Lee Hodge's swing and breaking it down, and again, I started looking at it when he won, just like, hey, man, what is this guy doing? I noticed that his, that his iron swing is a little bit steeper, and it may be because he bends this arm, he has to get his hands a little bit higher. And he's, he's not as deep, but he's high, has good width, and it allows him to attack maybe a little bit stronger and down on it and cover the ball a little bit. But with his driver, he has a clearly different hand path, and he's a little bit flatter on the way back. He's not flat, but he's flatter than he is with his iron. So there is a difference in plane there, which is something that you don't traditionally see because you want to do something that's pretty repetitive. But again, it worked for him this week, and it, it, it looked good on him too. Yeah. He, he was very confident. Uh, so, yeah, he has a couple of different little moves in his swing between driver and irons, and you just don't see that very often. No. And, and we, we talked off air a little bit about when, when you're talking with swing coaches, what their intentions are. It, and I know, like you guys said, it varies from coach to coach how they're going to teach these kids. Definitely. And I had the privilege of his coach, Stephen Purrier, mm -hmm. over, in, uh, over at Canebrake. And so that was my swing coach when I was in college. So I had a chance. I've actually – I went to him – Dang, I was hitting a huge snap hook uh, my first year of college, and so I decided to pick him. And our goal and his goal was to minimize that hook, actually take me to a slight fade, take out the left side of the golf course. I couldn't control the draw. It had gotten way too large. And so the goal was to zero out my path and try to get my exit a little more to the left because I exited so far to the right. And then if I didn't – control the face or do things it was very armsy of a golfer didn't cover the ball well and so what Stephen, the way that he teaches is he teaches an exit left you know zeroing out the path and and controlling the club face more with your body and less with your hands soft right elbow like you said with with lee i think that is something that's very important the way that Stephen teaches and i love the soft right elbow it's just a lot of golfers don't have the flexibility to be able to do the soft right elbow to have that much side bend and so um, the swing you know it works great for Lee um, that's why I think it's very important to take the golfer as it comes and um, and teach to that golfer's skill level and their flexibility level right and I agree with you completely and I think this is something that people need to pay attention to our viewers you know we're just weekend warriors we might get to play on the weekend or something or just when uh, we have time after work or whatever it sure. is, and you got to take a swing like Lee. He has perfected what he's doing, and I agree with it. I love quieting the hands. Every lesson that comes in, if I had 10 lessons today, I would say 10 out of 10, they're too handsy. So taking somebody that's too handsy and trying to swing like Lee is not going to work because they're going to try to zero out the path, but they're still going to be flipping at it, and where's the ball still going to go? Left. Left, exactly. And it's, the thing is, is late in life, or if you don't practice a lot, um, it's hard to do a swing like his. So the thing is, is what they need to do is focus on hand control and you have drills like that and not try to zero out that path. Work with the path that they have. Usually the path is the most consistent thing in a golfer That's when right. they come in. Golfers come in and they're like, I'm swinging over the top, but they swing over the top at the same degree every time. And then the face is gonna deviate 10 degrees from shot to shot. And that's the problem is just get face control first. And then you worry about trying to find that natural path. And, and again, Lee just perfected it and he started at a young age and Definitely. he's been working with it. He's been with the same coach probably. I think almost 20 day. years. Yeah, so uh, good for him. And again, that swing does work for him, but you have to have super quiet hands. And I'll go ahead and say 95% of people like you, me, Jason and you, our hands are not quiet. Yeah. 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 Hey. 
Uh, I was just going to say, like, when it comes to, like, you know, main guys that are playing professional and they have certain types of swings, like, what's the main swing that you would say most people would use and how would you perfect that, in y'all's opinion? So, that's a million-dollar question. Uh, Again, I'll tell you this. I'm very pro. There is no one swing. Um, I teach on both sides of zero. And what I mean is zero is going to be basically your path and face match your target line perfectly. I don't care if you come in, I need to find your stock shot. And it all relies basically on what your mobility, your stability, and your coordination levels are. Once we narrow those down, we can decide what is a stock swing for you. You may be a pull fader of the ball. You may be a push drawer of the ball. You may be a push and puller. We don't really know, but again, there is no one swing. But what we, what, why me and Jason partnered up on with VC Golf is because we have the same beliefs. There are a lot of instructors out there that push that one swing because they want to be that guy that has that one swing that that guy is using on tour or at a college level, and they can say, hey, I, that's my swing. Yeah. We don't do that. We, we work with everybody as an individual. Um, again, we have things that we like to see in positions in the swing, but how you get there could be different for you and you and me. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Yeah. So, uh, again, it just, it just takes individual analysis, and then basically we create a process for you. So that's, and that's how you perfect it is it's all process-oriented. Gotcha, gotcha. How much do you guys watch when you watch a, say, a PGA Tour event, you know, final round, and you watch all the replays and all that? Do you guys kind of study that like, say, a baseball player would when he's watching, say, the home run derby or he's watching one of the slow-mo bat path coming through hitting the ball? You guys do the same when you watch a PGA Tour event? It's amazing that you actually do. And so you're watching a PGA Tour event, and you're like, man, his hand's really bowed. I wonder why he's doing that. His hand's really cut. And how does that work? And how does that work? The right hand's underneath, (laughs) the left hand's on top. How's he hitting a big, huge draw or a big cut like that, you know? Um, And so you're watching watching the tournament, and your, your instruction mind starts to come out, and you're watching it, and you're like, how did he hit that low spinner with a 60 degree wedge off that tight lie? You know, I want to figure that out. Did he use the bounce or not? And so yeah. it it actually does. You know, you you if you've been teaching for a long time, and you end up going to the teaching side of, of watching golf. Yeah, my wife hates it because I'll hit stop and play and <laughs> and it's kind of like Correct. think about this. I I got a buddy that's a roofing and he's like, man, I'd used to just ride be able to ride down the road and not look at anything but paying attention to where I'm going. But yeah. now I'm looking at the roofs, like, man, it's terrible. Or that one is, you know what I'm saying? For so sure. For us, yeah, we we uh, are focused on the swings, wondering why why things click. You know, on tour is awesome. You got the best of the best getting it done. Um, and where people get confused is actually there's probably about four or five positions that these players get in on a consistent basis, and they're all in those positions. Yeah. But what throws them off is how they get there. One guy may take it way outside. One guy may take it way inside. One guy gets really hingy. One guy gets real unhingy. You know what I'm saying? So they don't really see those minute things that they're all doing the same, and it mainly is happening in, in the magic zone, which is through the impact zone, and there's about 48 inches down there, 36 inches, that they're all relatively the same. Uh, and that's what we strive for is we look at these four and five positions. How do we get you where you can be closer to these positions? Um, so, yeah, our, our, our teaching hat, mine does, I know, all the time on TV. Definitely. How the heck did he just do that? Because some of them just don't look right, and you have yeah. to slow it down. Sure. Unfortunately, we TV is what thirty frames per second. We got two hundred and forty frames in here, so we, you know, you're getting big gaps on TV. So you're trying to piece it together. It's kind of fun. Yeah, I I know. Every time I've covered a golf tournament, I go back like I'm like I want to go play a round of golf because I watched all these guys do it all week, and then I don't do it. (laughs) So uh, you know, at least you went out and played though. Yeah, yeah, it was fun for the first two holes, and then you know you're eighteen over after uh, two, but. uh, it's it's good it's good to know but you know it's i've noticed that because i you know as a baseball player even now i'm you know 20 you know almost 20 years removed from my playing days my favorite part is even on like say a cni single through the left side they'll show the slow-mo of how the guy made contact with it and what looked like an impossible pitch to hit somehow he gets those hands in he drives it through the left side so it's it's good to know that golfers do the same thing like sure. say baseball players do definitely and they show good information now on the pga you got basically the apex which is pretty cool a lot yeah. of people don't know how important that is but apex yeah. you got ball speed and you got carry and that's just fun to watch 
and people can use that data and compare themselves if you've got a top tracer facility like here because you're getting that same data. Yeah, it is. And they use top tracer on the <laughs> PGA Tour. And so that's the good thing about here. Same it's the same data. technology same that they're using on the PGA Tour. Yeah, that is awesome. That is awesome. Well, coming up next here, it's our mailbag segment where me and Hank are going to fire off a few questions to the guys. That's coming up next on the back nine. Tennessee Flight Training. We are training the next generation of pilots. Come and see why Tennessee Flight Training is the best way to learn to fly. Tennessee Flight Training. The skies are calling. A local law firm respected throughout the state. Generations of clients have turned to Boston, Holt, and Durham since 1948. We assist individuals and businesses with their legal needs, including real estate, property closings, personal injury, employment discrimination, and family law. Our clients get the personal attention and convenience of a hometown law firm with the resources and ability to handle any case. Come see us at Boston, Holt, and Durham. Hey, this is Phil Hooper. Get the look you want for your favorite school, church, or business with apparel from HD Ink Screen Printing in Leoma, Tennessee. Got a logo you need embroidered or screen printed? Let HD Ink give you the professional look that sets the bar in today's world. We do fundraisers and custom designed apparel and so much more. Call today, 931-201-2961 or come see us at our new shop located at 26 Ingram Road in Leoma. Remember, HD Ink for the look you want and the look you deserve. This is the X Sports Network. Back here on the back nine, it's now time for our mailbag segment. We don't have one here for the first week, so when the week's coming ahead here on the back nine, we want you guys to uh, fill up our mailbag. We'll give you guys that link and, and show a lot of questions here to the guys. So first off, it's just going to be me and Hayden just kind of spitfiring here. First one, a, a kind of a fun one off the get-go. So what is your favorite food guys before games it's before matches game. during matches and after matches what do you want to eat before during and after okay so before yeah. i always personally like to eat um chicken okay and then during it's peanut butter and jelly sandwiches <laughs> and then afterwards um depending on how i played if i played really good we might have a steak if i played terrible Ooh. i'm gonna eat a salad <laughs> <laughs> you see, you're like punishing yourself. Yeah. Like, it's just like my, my clubs. I'm gonna leave that them was, in the car and punish them. That was before or after the lashes. Uh, before. <laughs> <laughs> so me, uh, can is it a lot? No, I'm just kidding. No. Um, I don't eat much. I've always yeah. that's been one of my weaknesses. Is um, I'm a light eater during the day. I eat like dinner and that's it. I don't eat lunch or breakfast. Yeah. Uh, which does I, I noticed i've just played in a recent tournament yeah. um in montgomery two weeks ago and i ran out of energy pretty quick yeah. and uh but i just wasn't hungry it, it was kind of a weird thing so i'm not the best ask for that but if you see these guys these college kids and these professionals on tour they're always eating some kind of uh, energy bar mm -hmm. along with yeah. definite h2o you got to get the h2o I would stay away from caffeine. Uh, it'll give you a little bit of jitters. The thing yeah. is, is in golf, you want to grip the club light. Yeah. And if the lighter you grip it, the more you'll feel those little anxious shakes sure. yeah. due to the caffeine. Again, um, if you're a caffeine addict, like I am a little bit, you may be as well. Definitely. I get it early in the morning and let it taper off, so I sure. just don't get that, that crash. You Correct. Know? Uh, but again, I, I encourage eating. I need to do better, but I don't have anything. I'm, peanut butter and jelly i may try well that, and i i figured that out from watching tiger woods 
He's yeah. a peanut butter and jelly. He had three or four of them in his bags at all times, and he had a banana in there with it. So it's a big. So peanut butter and jelly, the calories from peanut butter, it stays with you the whole round. He and has so, a caddy that carries all that around. We definitely. had to carry our own bags. I know. So I, was, I was packing light. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing in there. <laughs> and peanut butter's heavy. That's right. So uh, no John Daly liters of Diet Coke and you know, no. just, just sucking them down throughout the course you know, of the tournament. Not a good idea. A couple of cigs might be. <laughs> you might feel like you need a drink and a, and a, and a, and a couple yeah. of cigarettes, but no. I don't know how he did it and stayed hydrated and actually, you know, played as good as he did mm -hmm. drinking all that Diet Coke. Not sure. I saw him at the a at nature. PGA Tour event. He finished in the top 15 of this one that I covered. I mean, it was every every tee box he was downing a 20 ounce Diet Coke. Like yeah, how he was bouncing off the walls everywhere he went is amazing to me. And again, to each their own. Yeah. I'm telling you, you can, these guys are, you got to think back in the John Daly days, say early Tiger, pre Tiger. These guys were not waking up. And they have a gym that goes around in a trailer, yeah. so these players can literally get to the course several hours earlier, and they're literally working right. their tail off, mm -hmm. yeah. pulling in a sweat, and then they're going to go walk 18 holes. Yeah. Uh, golf has just transformed so much, and we're beginning to – I even have a shirt that says golfers are athletes too. Yeah. I like to yeah. believe right. that, and they really are. Uh, but, again, you can s still be talented and – be a John Daly too. Yeah, I mean, I, I, tour events I've covered, it's it's amazing. They'll play 18. You know, they get to the course early. They hit on the range for an hour, or an hour, two hours. Then they'll walk 18. Then they'll go back to the range. Then they'll go to the gym for an hour. Yeah. Or in, I saw in uh, Sergio uh, Garcia's case, he would go play a, a bunch of tennis. Right. Afterwards, I'm like, how do you guys have this? Mm -hmm. Energy to do this, but mm -hmm. they do. It's it's pretty amazing. It is. It is. So uh, next question, do we have a new major format? I know they switched things around. Masters is always going to be the first, but now they've moved the PGA Championship up. British Open's now the last one. You guys like that, dislike it, or you like the old way of doing things? No, I actually like the new way it's done. I like having one a month and moving. I think it's great that they moved the PGA up. Uh, that's our championship as PGA members and, and PGA instructors. And so I think having it towards the end of the summer, it ran into the playoffs and all that was jammed together. And then you had the Ryder Cup or you had the President's Cup, and it was just so much at the end. And at the beginning, there wasn't a lot. I do like having the Masters, PGA, British Open, or U.S. Open, British mm -hmm. Open, and then go into the playoffs. I think it spreads it out a little bit and puts it throughout the year. Uh, and then it, I think it also helps with the weather. The PGA at the end mm -hmm. always seemed to be in a place where it was really, really hot. Yeah. And so this way they can utilize a few different courses and things like that and not always have to put it up north. Yeah, I don't mind it at all. I actually kind of like it. It's predictable, one a month. And uh, the only thing it took me a little bit getting used to is when they moved the players around. Yeah. You know, Notorious, just it was a Mother's Day, you know, yeah. things like that. And that's not happening anymore. Uh, but again, I think it's it's great for golf, and hopefully one day they'll the players will be a fifth major. I mean, it still gets tossed around for yeah. sure. Yeah, one of my greatest golf shots, my only golf achievement, is I birdied the 17th. Way to go! There at the that's a tough hole. Yeah, way I, to go! I don't know how it happened. That that <laughs> that that uh, not only further increased my belief in God, but that's the only way that that could have done. Did you that. black out? Yeah. Next hole, you know, I was you know three over triple bogey, but at least I birdied that one. So it's, that's it. That's yeah. what I That's hey. awesome. Uh, so I know I have a ritual or like a lucky charm. You know, it's usually maybe like a lucky tee or a lucky hat or something. Do y'all have anything y'all do before like matches or rounds or anything? So. In college and high school, I was pretty ritualistic, I'd call it, yeah. kind of superstitious. Yeah. I would even write something on my glove, whatever it was that would pertain to me, or, you know, maybe pull my right sock up a little high. I mean, just weird stuff. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I think you can probably relate in baseball, because yeah. I think that's a big thing, superstitious, uh, being really superstition. Uh, as I've gotten a little older, I realized none of that really mattered, and it was just extra things to think about. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't. No, yeah, I, I, I purely don't, um, but I did. I'd mark my ball a certain way, and if I, you know, you'd try to mark the ball in the dimples, and if the dimple pattern was a little off, I would toss that ball. <laughs> like, I'd be like, really? that mark is not where it needs to be. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I just don't, yeah. not going to use that golf ball. Yeah. And then I would, yeah, I mean, it was, I was 
Yeah. So yeah. a good question. I mean, I did that back in the yeah, day. Yeah, I right? got you. Yep. There's still one thing that I always do is in my pocket, I carry four coins. I carry a penny, a nickel, a dime, and a quarter. And they all have to be from 1972 or below. So I'll shoot even par or below. And I still do that to this day. I'll tell you what you should do. What's that? Is if you punish yourself or reward <laughs> yourself. If, it, if it's inside five feet, use the penny. There you go. And if you keep pulling out the quarter, that means you're not hitting it close enough. That's, That's a pretty good idea. I never thought about that. it like yeah, that. I kind of like that. That's awesome. There but except for you guys to get a little bit with some ideas today. <laughs> yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. Yeah, if you're marking with the quarter, that means you need a lesson, so give us a call. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm using the quarter. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, I need a silver dollar for me. That's yeah, we can a, do that. <laughs> but uh, so we got a segment coming up tonight on Exports Live. We always have a big topic. So our big topic tonight is the biggest underachievers and overachievers in sports. So for you two, who do you think are the biggest overachievers and the biggest underachievers in golf ever in the history of golf? Wow. wow. Need to edit this video. <laughs> <laughs> uh so underachievers that's a, that's a good one um <laughs> can i can i start off with one yes this one that popped yeah. sergio he's only won one major you know and and there's a lot of talk out there about that and so i think that the big thing that he's always struggled with is a wonderful swing probably the one of the best ball strikers on tour but he also is probably the one of the worst putters on tour and so um, he still won, you know, maybe 20, 25 tournaments across the world. And so he's going to end up being a Hall of Famer. But in the majors, you have to putt well. You have to – I mean, he hits the ball straight, but you have to putt well. Yeah, so Sergio, he – if you slow down his swing, typically the back swing and the down swing, you want to get that club. It's going to shallow out and it should drop fairly below – the take swing but they're relatively close they match Sergio has a pretty big gap and the bigger that gap is the more you rely on timing yeah. and he shallows it so far and he almost has that Lee Hodges look but he takes it to a whole nother level and I think that's under pressure it doesn't hold up but as far as when he's just out there with the boys or playing a practice round or on a Thursday Friday round when pressure is not as great he's one of the best out there but then he can fall off pretty quick um but back to it, I mean, it took me a minute to think of a player, and I'm going to give you a pretty funny answer, is I think the biggest over and underachievers is the same guy, Ooh, and that's going to okay. be Ricky Fowler because okay. – I was thinking that yeah, earlier. I was thinking I, that that's too. He, yeah. he should win way more than yeah. he ever has. Yeah. But he had the reputation that he was winning every week. One of the, I mean, if, if on tour, he's the most, one of the most likable guys. The fans love him. He yeah. stops for everybody. I mean, he's, he's – he's, just his personality, the way he presents himself, he's 100% professional and he has a good game. But again, he just couldn't handle the pressure when it came down to Saturday, Sunday. You got Saturday's moving day. You got to move. He could maybe be in contention on Thursday, Friday, and then couldn't move. The movers would pass him on Saturday, and if he was still in contention, the pressure would get to him, and he he wouldn't he wouldn't pull it off. And uh, Again, how many tournaments has he won? I mean, there's it's less than four, right? I think four or five. Yeah, yeah. At pretty most. pretty few. So I think he yeah. is my my under and overachiever because again, he 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 gets the publicity of one of the top ranked players week in and week out, even when he wasn't even on TV. Yeah. His marketing money is still way up there to just use Ricky in in the public eye. But he just hasn't won a lot. But um, yeah, well, could, could you say maybe an overachiever is like a Bubba Watson, self-taught guy, kind of came out of nowhere. I know he's won two Masters, but you know he didn't have the luxury of some of the things other people had. He, you know, lefty and had the way he's had to do things. He would kind of be in the overachiever category. I think he's done a great job. I think his, you know. Um, I have a buddy, Stuart Clark, and you know Stuart. You're friends with him as well. Grew up playing with Bubba. I actually played in a tournament, and Bubba was right behind me. And the guy at that age, you know, his swing looked the same. It was different, but he hit the ball great, and he could move the ball at the flagstick. And so um, I think that he was destined to win and destined to be on the PGA Tour. But he did, like you said, he didn't go to PGA Pros. He didn't do the instruction side. He kind of just plays by feel. Yeah. And um, – 
you know, I, I think that can be a good thing. It can also be a bad thing in some <laughs> retrospect because when your feel is off or your timing is off in a swing like that, it's going to be trouble. Yeah, and I think we've seen spurts of that in their career. Yep. You know, um, I, I'm really big on self-diagnosis. I try to teach the cause and effect yeah. of why things happen. Having to rely on somebody in an individual sport, sport does not make sense. Right. So. I constantly need somebody looking at me and telling me what I'm doing wrong. Well, when you're out on the course, you can't have the luxury of that. Um, so I, I think there's it's kind of a blessing yeah. to not rely on a swing coach and kind of teach yourself the feels and, and be more of a feel player versus a structure player. And, and I think maybe the biggest underachiever of, of all time in golf, and they made a documentary about his failings, which is Greg Norman. Mm-hmm. I think Greg uh, Norman's yeah. there. Very I think good. John Daly's there as yeah, well. Absolutely. I mean, he, yeah. what a – both of them, Greg Norman, you know, he had, what, three chances to win the Masters? Four chances? Well, I would put him in the category is he achieved – he put himself in the positions he needed right. to. Yeah. He couldn't close it. Yeah. He, he's the – Sad shark slam. <laughs> man, uh, just hard to watch. Uh, and actually, he doesn't get the credit yeah. due yes. for the talent that yeah. he had yeah. and still like, probably does. Yeah. I mean, you've Top seen that five guy. five wins all time. Yeah, I mean, he's – I think Phil Mickelson could be in that category. I mean, how, how often does he finish top three and four in majors? And, yeah. and you know, he's, he's one of the most winningest players out there. But as far as we, we count majors, yeah. uh, and he still has majors, but he, he, he hasn't closed the door on a lot of events yeah. that he should have. I mean, a lot of second places out yeah. there. I mean, you know, Jack Nicklaus might have won as many as he did, but he also has the most second-place finishes of all time, too. It's – like you guys have said multiple times, it's – really hard to win a golf tournament. Mm-hmm. It is, and especially hard to win majors. It is. It, it is, and people like, I, I don't, it's funny how human nature, we begin to expect things yeah. from people. Uh, like Tiger, you know, how dominant he was, and, and that, that's just unheard of, and you got like Scotty Scheffler and John Rahm. Scotty Scheffler is a machine out there finishing top five and top ten. I don't, I don't I'm sh- I don't know how he does it. I mean, does he win every week? No, but his name is on the leaderboard. He's chasing. You feel it. Yeah. John Rahm's the same way. He's kind of falling off a little bit later in the year, but that guy is – you don't want to see his name on the leaderboard. Yeah. He, he's comfortable there. Uh, so to, to be in the top 15 or 20 every week is, is just really tough. And we'll talk about a local guy, Stuart Sink. Mm-hmm. Um, Stuart, if you ask him, he doesn't get a lot of media attention yeah. – even after he's been winning. He's playing better now than he did when he was in his 20s. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's like, man, I was comfortable finishing 30 and 40 every week. I was making cuts and I was making a paycheck and then I didn't have to answer questions after I got done. <laughs> uh, I was out of the eye, you know, yeah. nobody had expectations yeah. of me. And uh, so it's just where you want to be and where you're comfortable. For sure. All right, guys, I thought we had a pretty good first episode here. Looking forward Definitely. to working with you guys week in and week out, and especially that third segment, learning mm-hmm. something. I don't know if it's going to help me. I'm just going to help somebody. Right. But, uh, you know, it, it was definitely a lot and of fun. If you fun. don't send us videos or ask questions, we're going to make him That's get right. I don't know if he wants to do that. What, my, or you. Well, if you want some yeah, good comedy. Yeah, <laughs> If you want some good comedy, I'm all about uh, oh, you yeah. guys going out there <laughs> diagnosing my, uh, my hack-a-shack swing out there. Sure. <laughs> all right. So for uh, Hayden Burks, Daniel Creer, and Jason Vaughn, I'm AJ Good. This is The Back Nine. We will see you guys next week. This is the X Sports Network.